One of the fondest memories that I have of my early childhood is watching Tom and Jerry on the weekends. It was life without responsibilities and a world full of imagination. But apart from the perfection of comedy without dialogue, there was something else about Tom and Jerry that caught my eyes, which sparked an ever-long love affair with the strange aspect of animation. Food. Specifically, food in animation. There is something about the portrayal of food in animated form that incites the brain to indulge, to delve deep into a piece of two-dimensional visual and experience flavors that are kinda non-material. I had never tried nor been anywhere near a roast turkey before this, but much to my surprise even today, it's like I can vividly remember how this scene, this sumptuous visual, tastes like. And of course, this is not strictly common to just Tom and Jerry, but in the medium of animation, sometimes food just hits different. And since food is an interesting aspect of animation that no one really talks about, so be it. Here's an exploration of that delicious decadence, the insatiable realm of animated food. The journey takes us all the way back to the dawn of animation. The time when everything great about animation flowed right through the heart of Disney. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, as some would say, was a turning point for the entire medium. And for all intents and purposes of this conversation, the starting point of this journey. Despite the early life of animation in the world of the monochrome, this was the first time a group of animators sat around a table to acknowledge the dimension of what food might actually look like in Technicolor animation. Nothing fancy or flashy here, just the main character preparing some soup and then later a gooseberry pie. The colors of the food are quite muted. The images, understandably for the time period, a bit static. But no matter how you see it, these scenes still hold a level of nostalgia, a certain warmth about the way the pie is at first put together, and the way the steam just infuses into the ambience. It's almost like the animation, despite it being just plain and visual, is also meant for your nose. And so, keeping in line with this, the food in the 40s only looked better. Although Disney were doing their thing on one side, some of the best looking food in animation at the time was captured through cartoons like Tom and Jerry. The variety, the texture, the vibrance, everything was turned up a notch to accommodate every taste buds known to humans. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a certain degree of exaggeration at play here. The real versions of these delectable cuisines would probably not look like this. By the name of creative freedom, the animated food, regardless of the inaccuracies in its looks, more than just makes up for it in its physical composition. I mean, this could arguably be one of the first colored animated portrayals of jelly. And honestly, it looks like the real deal. The fundamentals of animation still work here. The jelly wobbles, the pastry is creamy, and the roast turkey looks roasted to perfection. Whether it's through the sound effects or through the illustration of aromatic fumes, the animation of food here is all-encompassing. They aren't just pointless drawings, but rather, they're designed to grab your attention. And as classical animation became more diverse and colorful, one of the common denominators that always made the final cut was food. Whether it be a whimsical sandwich from a version of Scooby-Doo, or a steaming hot pot of chili, or maybe even Scooby Snacks? Oh, yeah. That's the good stuff, Scoob. Food was now considerably a part of the cartoon experience. The mouth-watering Krabby Patties from Spongebob, the scorching chili peppers from Swart Cats, a rather interesting looking lasagna from Garfield, the bizarre Monday mystery lunch from Oswald, and pretty much anything from The Simpsons. Buffalada, barbecue brisket sandwich, barbecue chicken sandwich, smoky bacon greens, seafood au gratin, seafood gumbo. Every cartoon had their own version of food. While some of them looked plain and simple, others brandished the exotic. And the world of animated features was no different either. The animators produced a variety of cuisines that were not just appetizing, but also things that were nostalgia inducing. Who could forget the spaghetti scene from The Lady and the Tramp? 
and even that leaning cake from Sleeping Beauty. The cookies in Alice in Wonderland, and leading into Disney's Renaissance, the congee from Mulan, Gumbo from The Princess and the Frog, or even that cheesy pizza from a goofy movie. Food in classic western animation had that global reach. It was truly the introduction for a lot of children into the flavorful world of food. But of course, even with all the love we have for these dishes, there was always room for more growth. And it just so happens that with the arrival of new technology, you could simply bring new dimensions to animated food. Now picture this, you were a kid in the 90s and you heard that a movie called Toy Story had come to the theaters. You go to the movies and watch it, only to realize that it was something totally different from what you were used to. You had witnessed for the first time ever, animation that had depth. Depth brought a sense of perceptive realism to animation, a dimension that had not really been explored before. And although Toy Story may not hold up to the standard of animation today, it was perhaps the best they could do with what they had. And for that, it was brilliant. For the very first time, you could perceive depth of field. Shadows made perfect sense now, and objects in this world fell much closer to reality. And this meant that you could try to achieve realism with that of food as well. Slowly but steadily, food started popping up in 3D animation, perhaps one of the best iterations of it being in the return of Toy Story. Now, Cheetos in an animated film was probably something that you had never expected, but something that holds up pretty well. The colors and the saturation were on point, with the animators even getting the Cheeto dust to perfection. And for the very first time, the food had a layer of texture to it and combined that with the sound, well, now you get something immersive. But around this time, there was a major breakthrough in the world of computer graphics, with a massive shift towards portraying how different objects interact with light in order to achieve a sense of realism. With translucent objects like skin, light doesn't just bounce off of the surface, it penetrates and scatters internally, sort of creating this gradient-like effect on the material. This process was naturally called subsurface scattering, and it was used for the first time in The Lord of the Rings to make Gollum look realistic. And since it did a good job to portray a realistic skin, these scattering models were designed for 3D animation as well. And if you look pretty closely, you might even be able to catch the distinction between the lighting in these objects before and after the inception of this technique. But of course, the technology was new and the animators were still figuring things out on the job. So there were priorities. Characters got the better end of the deal, with the objects falling down the pecking order. And in the context of food, although different lighting techniques were used to light these dishes, they were not quite fully illuminated to perfection. And so, although the food looks better than their previous iterations, still, with better computing power, it could look even better. Flour, eggs, sugar, hmm, vanilla bean, oh, small twist of lemon. Oh, you can smell all that? You have a gift! The Incredibles posited the challenge of lighting the skin. But in Ratatouille, a film based on a rat who loves to cook, you had better put emphasis on lighting the food. For this, the animators turned to the fascinating world of food photography, where light is the crux of the profession. Cause well, you might not be able to use photography to replace 3D animation, but you can certainly learn from it. And through this, the animators had gained enough feedback to realize that the trick to mouth-watering food was mainly based on how soft it looks, the reflections on its surface, and also its saturation slash vibrance levels. The softness of food is correlated to the amount of light passing through it. The more the light, the softer it looks. And you can clearly see how this makes a big difference. Honey! <laughs> And since food interacts with light in a similar organic way to that of skin, Pixar already had the technology. All they had to do was tweak it. 
And so, on top of the scattering models, they developed a new type of light called gummy light. A light designed to pass right through certain objects, softening these objects even further. And the idea was to use these techniques in tandem in every shot of food to appreciate the intricacies of diverse cuisines. In this shot, notice how these models perform their magic as layers of light are added in every step to create that cozy organic feel. And finally, the overall appeal of animated food, regardless of the type of animation being carried out, is always tied to colors. If you get the balance of colors right, you got yourself a pleasing meal. And the animators made sure they stuck to this principle by using illumination techniques that made the food pop out from the background when necessary. Ratatouille, the main dish in the film, is a concoction of vibrant analogous colors that separates the dish from the muted background. But in other shots where the food had to look a bit modest, the coloring was rather subtle, with faint glowing cheese wheels that were kept away from the primary source of light. And in the world of animated food, Ratatouille was revolutionary. It actually cared about something that was considered to be a background element. For the first time, probably ever, there was effort that was put in to emphasize food. And all of this effort would not go unnoticed. Where are you? Bad donkey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said don't. Don't. No. Get away from it. Animation that succeeded at Ratatouille that could afford a sizable budget made sure that they put at least some effort into making the food look appetizing. So, not long after it, Cloudy with a chance of meatballs, in fact, invoked food into the main narrative. And although it was probably just a half-decent story, the quality of the animated food was exquisite. <laughs> this was arguably one of the freshest and the most delicious burgers I had ever seen at this point in 3D animation. The noodles and the bean buns from Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> The ice rolls in Brave. The entire dinner table in How to Train Your Dragon. The tamales from Coco. The pizza from Seoul. The breakfast scene in Encanto. And you get the picture. With the access and flexibility in different lighting techniques and rendering, 3D animation kept progressing the deliciousness of food to the point where we reached Bao. Just look at how wet and glossy this filling looks. It captures a sense of freshness without jeopardizing the realness. It's almost like something straight out of a food commercial. But that is the point. The essence of animating food is not just about making something look real, but there has to be a bit of marketing about it to make the audience use their imagination. As Tom Howey, a famous food illustrator puts it, when looking at an illustration, you only have the visual sense. You can't smell or touch it. So your imagination goes into overdrive. Now, with all that being said and done, if I'm being completely honest, an exploration of animated food is nowhere near complete without delving into the creative world of Japanese animation. Although anime hasn't been around as long as Western animation, it has always had a simplistic approach to animating food. And food, unlike other things, has always remained a constant and in many ways a token of appreciation of the medium itself. But then again, food in anime is a topic that extends like the ocean. In fact, there are even websites dedicated to showcase just how routine this is. So, instead of going through every possible iteration of anime food, I want to explore the most influential ones, the ones that inspired a food revolution within this whole medium. No conversation about animated food would be considered complete without entertaining the most ambitious yet simple mechanism through which Studio Ghibli captures the world of gastronomy. Sometimes it's hard to ignore the kind of emphasis they put on even the simplest of dishes. But it is as predictable as a force of habit. In a Ghibli film, you can expect the food to look delicious. I have often wondered why food in Ghibli films feels quite different to that of the others. Well, after all, it is also an extension of the greater animated world of food. 
But here, it's not simply about getting the visuals of these dishes right, but rather it's about getting the feeling of the visuals right. And honestly, that goes a really long way in conveying taste. What exactly makes something taste good is riddled with a whole lot of subjectivity. But sometimes the feel-good factor of a certain dish kind of induces an extra ounce of flavor. It is by no means quantifiable, but likely that you experienced it, you know that it is qualifiable. And this is the magic formula invoked by most Studio Ghibli food scenes. They mean more than what is being portrayed. In this scene from Ponyo, the food looks delicious. The ramen has that hand-drawn glossy finish combined with a bubbling broth that exudes a lovely aromatic steam. You can almost taste how good it is. That's how much emphasis Miyazaki puts into it. But that is simply not the full experience here. When you watch the scene, there's so much more than just a bowl of ramen. The food here is accompanied by the feeling of comfort. It is in and of itself not something extravagant to begin with. It's a modest bowl of ramen. But the whole scene from the start to the finish is about a mom making some warm noodles for the kids as a violent storm rages in the background. This is as relatable as food could ever get. In this very scene, it's not just the food that looks appetizing, but rather the whole experience around it that tastes like home, which makes it the definition of comfort food. And in another example in Spirit Away, the food takes a much deeper meaning. Here, the good-looking food is brazenly enticing, but also a trap. It is a representation of consumerism and how desire takes over people to the point where it becomes gluttony. Visually, the food still looks tasty, but seeing what happens to Chihiro's parents, it no longer feels tasty. It feels adulterated. But in contrast, the scene where Haku offers a nigiri to a distressed Chihiro, the food isn't portrayed to be extravagant. It is quite simple, and the visuals portray that. But that is not the purpose of this shot. The food here is a representation of minimalism, and in the context of the movie, yet again, it has to do with the feeling of comfort. But this feeling is still only a part of the overall experience, for the other half of it is portrayed through how the food is prepared. If you observe a food scene from Studio Ghibli, regardless of the director, you'll notice a fascinating overlap in the way cooking always precedes the food. And there is a reason for it. Cooking is said to enhance the sense of taste. And according to Jane Ogden, a professor of health psychology, preparing food ourselves may have additional effects because it's multi-sensory. The smells, sounds, and tastes of active food preparation tell our body that food is coming. This generates an anticipatory response in both our mind and body, getting us ready to eat. Indeed, unlike this real-world study, animated food is primarily visual. However, as Studio Ghibli perceives it, it doesn't always have to be that way. About half of this 5 minute long breakfast scene in House Moving Castle involves the main characters preparing food. The visuals of the food looks fantastic here, but notice the subtle sound effects that makes the cooking sort of interactive. The bacon naturally sizzles. The sound of the eggs cracking against the stone. And even the bread while being cut makes a faint rustling sound. These sound effects are not just there as an embellishment, but rather they serve the purpose of enhancing the depth of this interaction to make the experience sort of multi-sensory. And you'll find this in almost all Ghibli films, whether it's through the eyes of Hayao Miyazaki, or Isao Takahara, or Goro Miyazaki. Regardless of the director, Studio Ghibli has a way with gastronomy. While the visuals are enticingly intricate and vibrant, the animators make sure it's also relatable and memorable. In other words, they fabricate a reality where food is a complete experience. And some of these basic guidelines rule Japanese animation. Food is given the utmost respect with regards to its appearance, the extrasensory information, and of course, the overall experience that comes along with it. And so, even outside the world of Studio Ghibli, animated food looks tantalizingly beautiful. The ramen from Naruto, the bento box from Demon Slayer, Brock's stew from Pokemon, that's progress. At least his mouth is working. Bell peppers and beef in Cowboy Bebop. There's no beef in here. 
So you wouldn't really call it bell peppers and beef, now would you? The toast from Chainsaw Man. Um. Mm. Everywhere you look in anime, there's always some great food to go around. But with all this said and done, I think it would be a tremendous disservice to not mention one of the best aesthetics of food in mainstream anime. Makoto Shinkai is arguably one of the best animators already, but when it comes to aesthetics, not many even come close. Stylistically, his world building is second to none in the way he portrays the real world and everything that comes along with it. So naturally, when Shinkai portrays food, it is bound to look sublime. The attention to detail, the colors, the whole aesthetic. It does have a lot of resemblance to other shots of food in anime. But I believe what separates Shinkai from the others is the idealism that he captures with food. There is a certain romance about the perception of food in these scenes, even if you were to regard them as fillers. Fantasizing about food is something that we all kind of do sometimes. And that is exactly what shots of food fulfill in a Shinkai film. And for this, these scenes might be the closest thing you'd get to food commercials. The multi-sensory experience is ever-present, with colors cranked up to the max, and sound effects that tingles your ears like ASMR. The freshness of food, captured through drops of colors, simulating droplets of water or oil, and the way the light just bounces off of the food, giving it that enchanting presence. It is no mystery that commercials of food are quite a gimmick in how they achieve that mouth-watering look. But for the brain, it triggers all the right signals to imagine and to make up for that lack of taste. In other words, the visuals add to the taste. Or as someone like Shinkai would tell you, the artistry adds to the taste. Different animators have different ways of achieving this delicious look. Sometimes they crank up the vibrance, and sometimes they add drops of water to simulate freshness. But no matter the technique, it is in fact true that anime in general takes a lot of care in producing an organic aesthetic of food. The scenes don't feel forced or mechanical, but rather they tend to give you quite an appetite. And that's how you get websites like these. You see, good looking food is tasty and instinctively something that we all appreciate. You can not enjoy an entire anime from the start to the finish, but you can always find time to cherish the fine details of animated food. Look, animated food is obviously not the real thing. It has its restrictions and shortcomings, which sometimes makes it hard to fully get a grasp of. The smells are understandably unavailable and the sense of touch is pretty much unreasonable. But even with all these clear deficiencies, for some reason we got so much time for animated food. Regardless of the type of animation, it is fun to sit in front of a screen, perhaps while holding a plate of food yourself, and let your mouth water for the attributes of food that still can be artistically manipulated. So much so that people will never stop enjoying moments like these. Colors of deliciousness complemented by the sounds of authenticity. This is the world of animated food and in reality, we all know that animated food probably shouldn't taste like anything. But as it happens, it does. <laughs>